Well, good morning and welcome to Worship at First Congregational Church in Concord online. We're so grateful that you are here and we hope that this time of worship brings a space of peace into your heart. Just a couple of announcements as we begin. The first is that everyone is welcome to join us for virtual coffee hour following worship if you would like. Everyone is invited to stay. We will take a brief break between the two, um, but uh, you don't need to log out. You can stay logged in and we will be in conversation together. The second announcement is that next week, um, we're, the 14th through the 20th, I will be on vacation. Um, and so next week, our worship service will be the January Jazz Sanctuary, and it'll be available in premiere at 10 a.m. on Sunday morning, but you can certainly watch it at any time after the premiere happens at 10 a.m. Um, this is the first time that we, the, uh, the guys and I have done all of our music virtually. Uh, we recorded things separately and put it all together. And I think we're all still amazed that any of that happened. So <laughs> if nothing else, you can see what it is that we've been up to. So we hope you'll, you'll join in that service um, on YouTube. That'll be on YouTube and I'll have the link on our email and the website for everyone. With that, I'm going to begin our worship with a First Peoples Land Acknowledgement. We want to acknowledge that we gather as First Congregational Church on the traditional land of the Wabanaki Confederacy, the Abenaki people, and the Penacook people, past and present, and honor with gratitude the land itself and the people who have stewarded it throughout a thousand generations. This calls us to commit to learning how to be better stewards of this land that we inhabit as well. And with that, I invite you to join with me as we prepare our hearts and our minds for worship as we listen to our prelude. We will now light our Trinity candles. We light a light in the name of the creator who loves life. In the name of the Christ who loves life. And in the name of the spirit who is the fire of life. Let us take a moment of silence to set our intentions for worship this morning, remembering that an intention is essentially a focus. And so in this moment, I invite you to choose a focus for worship. I invite you to join with me in our responsive call to worship. I will read all of the text and I invite you to join with me in the bolded print. We are called from the ends of the earth. We are called from the center of our lives. Men and women, young and old, rich and poor, strong and weak. We are all called into God's love to yearn for justice, and to pray for peace. Let us continue by bringing ourselves into God's presence together. You have shown us, O oh God, that grace changes life, that grace can turn the ordinary into the festive and emptiness into fullness. We when we find ourselves in you, O oh Christ, 
we find that we too are bearers of grace and that we too can be part of changing the world. Amen. Let us share together in our opening hymn, There is a Voice in the Wilderness Crying. This is number 120 in the hymnal, if you would like to follow in the hymnal. Adele, when you are ready. As we begin our agape feast, we begin with our gospel lesson for this morning, which is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 3, verses 1 through 22. In the 15th year of the rule of Caesar Tiberius, it was while Pontius Pilate was governor of Judah, and Herod, ruler of Galilee, and his brother Philip, ruler of Ituria, and Traconis, Lysanthia, ruler of Albany, during the priesthood of Ananias and Caiaphas. Then it was John, Zachariah's son, out in the desert at that time, received a message from God. He went all through the country around the Jordan River, preaching a baptism of life, changing leading to forgiveness of sins, as described in the words of Isaiah the prophet. Thunder in the desert, prepare God's arrival, make the road smooth and straight. Every ditch will be filled in, every bump smoothed out, the detours straightened out, and all the ruts paved over. Everyone will be there to see the parade of God's salvation. When crowds of people came out for baptism, because it was the popular thing to do, John exploded, brood of snakes. What do you think you're going doing slithering down here to the river? Do you think a little water on your snake skins is going to deflect God's judgment? It's your life that must change, not your skin. And don't think that you can pull rank by claiming Abraham as father. Being a child of Abraham is neither here nor there. Children of Abraham are a dime a dozen. God can make children out of stones if he wants. What counts is your life. Is it green and blossoming? Because of its dead wood, it goes in the fire. The crowd asked him, then what are we supposed to do? If you have two coats, give one away, he said. Do the same with your food. Tax men also came to be baptized and said, teacher, what should we do? 
He told them no more extortion, collect only what is required by law. Soldiers asked him, and what should we do? He told them no stakedowns, no blackmail, and be content with your rations. The interest of the people by now was building. They all begin to wonder, could this John be the Messiah? But John intervened, I am baptizing you here in the river. The main character in this drama to whom I am a mere stagehand will ignite the kingdom of life, a fire, the Holy Spirit within you, changing you from the inside out. He's going to clean house, make a clean sweep of your lives. He'll place everything true in its proper place before God. Everything false he'll put out with the trash to be burned. There was a lot more of this, words that gave strength to the people, words that put heart in them, the message. But Herod, the ruler, strung, stung by John's rebuke in the matter of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, capped his straw, long string of evil deeds with his outrage, and he put John in jail. After all the people were baptized, Jesus was baptized. As he was praying, the sky opened up and the Holy Spirit, like a dove descending, came down upon him. And along with the Spirit, a voice, you are my son, chosen and marked by my love, pride of my life. Here ends our gospel reading. Dear friends, this is a table of welcome and all are free to come and to eat. As we gather at this table and to worship together, we remember these words of our brother Jesus. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. We come to this table hungry and thirsty seeking to be satisfied. As we gather at this table, we remember these words of our brother Jesus. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. We come to this table weary and burdened, seeking rest. As we gather at this table, we remember that Jesus comes to us in those who are strangers to us, in those who are hungry, in those who are thirsty, and in those needing warmth. We come to this table as strangers in a strange land. We ask with humble confidence that you welcome us into your family, O oh God. Let us join together in our prayer of adoration. Living God, you are present in our midst and we praise you. You are tearing down walls of alienation and exclusion. For this we Just praise you because in Jesus, you have shown us a way of hospitality, simplicity, prayer, peacemaking, and resistance. Because your spirit makes a new path for us as we struggle to live in the shadow of doubt and fear, weak as we are, you fill us with hope. Lover of our souls, you give us joy, and we praise you. Amen. We take joy in the meal that we are about to share together, where we give our love and our attention to one another, even while we are apart. And remember that Jesus too is here in the midst of all of us. And in the midst of this sacred meal, we set three symbols to remind us of Jesus's promises to us. A candle to remind us that Jesus poured out his Holy Spirit upon us, giving us new life, new power, and a new hope. We, filled with the Spirit, bring the presence of God into a broken world. And bread, for Jesus is the bread of life. He nourishes us, and we put our trust in him. And grapes, a reminder of his struggle for justice and peace, a reminder of his suffering at the hands of the Roman Empire. He suffers still when the oppressed suffer injury at the hands of the powerful. Jesus is with us in this agape feast. 
So let us open our hearts to God and to one another and let us share in this feast of love entwined as we are by the Holy Spirit. And as we feast together, I will be sharing Wade in the Water as performed by the Acapella Academy. Psalter lesson for this morning from Psalm 51. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain in me a willing spirit. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you have no delight in sacrifice. If I were to give a burnt offering, 
you would not be pleased. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. Here ends our Psalter reading. I'm going to do a quick back change as we enter into our sharing of sacred stories. This morning, the invitation is to share our sacred stories about the room that you now see behind me, the Guild Room. Before we do that, I'm going to share a brief video of it, having walk in, walked through it. So during this, this about three minutes, I invite you to bring to mind many of the memories you have of this particular room. And so I invite you now to join me in this time of sacred story. And when you are ready to share a story that you have of this room, I invite you to unmute yourself and share. Yeah, Everett. 
We got to unmute. Wait, we got to unmute you. One sec. There you go. Perfect. Okay. It's not to begin with. It was not, it, this isn't a memory, but it's my impression. My first, I think when I very, walked into that um, guild room the first time, and ever since, I realized it was sacred territory. Mm -hmm. um, that it was in complete ownership of the women's guild mm -hmm. and they loved that room and they controlled they didn't control the room but they made sure that that guild room was always sacred and mm -hmm. that's that sticks to my mind and my, I have two memories and I'm sure I've said this many times um, we had um, a call for men um, <laughs> talent show one night in there and Richie Clark was my call for man. And the two of us, um, our skit was um, um, that I played Victor Borgie and he played the trump. I think it was a Sax trump saxophone. And um, we had we had a. I, I still look back at that skit. I I actually learned how to play chopsticks on the piano that night. <laughs> and uh, and I actually fell off the stool, um, oh. which he did in his in his skit, but. I, that was in both both Richie and I. That was a that was a memorable moment. I don't think either one of us have forgotten it. <laughs> and the other memory I have is that we had um, uh, a search meeting, um, a search committee meeting in the in that guild room that night. And I've told this story many times. But Mike Pride was the one that was um, chair of the of the um, search committee that that time, and he asked. He asked us any comments or any questions, and I couldn't resist. And, and Ed Brueggemann was at the meeting um, that night too. And I said, yes, I have two requests. I said, the first one is that we get a pastor that's not from the ENR, but came out of the um, Andover Newton on the Congregationalism background was my first request. And I said, my second request is that we finally get a woman pastor. And everybody kind of went, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, it, it was it was an answer that came to fulfillment. It was just one of those things that I will never, never forget in that, that night in the guild room. Mm -hmm. Those are my two memories. And again, like I said, it's always been a sacred room. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Everett. Yeah, Linda, why don't you go first and then Pam. Um, I I have many, many memories, too, with meetings and gatherings and receptions and whatnot, but I do remember the very first, probably the first time, one of the first times that we attended church at, at First Church, um, and we decided we were going to go to the coffee hour, and I was absolutely amazed, and still am, that I could barely move in that room, particularly looking at the size of it now but there were so many people. And the person I backed up to was Mel Studley. And for those of you who knew Mel, um, that started a bunch of craziness right there and then as far as um, Mel and First Church in, in general, because as you know, he had quite a sense of humor. And even though I don't, um, um, I, I enjoyed Mel very, very much. Mm. Thank you, Linda. Mm. Pam. Um, I of all the rooms at the ch in the church building, I was kind of stunned as you were playing this video at how hard this room hit me. Mm. I remember um, the women so proud after they had redone this room, and. Yes, Everett, there was a little control. Kids knew they could not touch that piano. Um, but um, so many of my family's um, sacred moments were, in, were part of this room, from standing there as a bride to my sisters, um, to baptizing my daughter. I have a picture of her on um, a pristine white little blanket on the floor um, as an infant waiting to go into church. And uh, from youth groups to meetings to conference meetings, it, it's just been such a part of my life that I, I'm actually a little shocked this morning. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, thank you, Pam. Thanks. Go ahead, Eleanor. Oh, you are muted. There you go. When I think of the Guild Room, um, I always think of hospitality and I think the warmth of that beautiful red carpet represents the, uh, the warmth and hospitality of that room. Um, as others have said, the many receptions and meetings and, and films and things that we've enjoyed in, in that room um, as a gathering of, of the church. And, um, but one memory in particular is when we had um, the display of nativities or crushes. Um, I couldn't believe how many they were and, and how I was touched with, you know, the fact that so many people had, in some cases, I think there were almost life-size figures mm -hmm. and then little miniature ones too. So um, that room does have many warm memories for me. Thank you, Eleanor. Everett, yep, you have to unmute again. And just that, that one time with the crisis with the with one of the nativities um, with one of the crashes too that would <laughs> someone someone knows what I'm what I'm talking about. <laughs> if I could if I could Go just ahead. add one one more thing that I mean there are so many memories that come rushing to me but um, as some of you know, I started and ran a group called Compassionate Friends many years ago, and this was a self-help support group for bereaved parents. And we had been meeting at a um, another church facility in town, and because of space and their own meetings, um, they had decided that they were going to move us into the nursery of the, their church, and it, this just was not... Um, an acceptable option for us. So I went to Don Jennings and I said, you know, this is the situation. Do you think we could, and I didn't know at the time, I did not know about the control. This was only maybe four years after we had started going to First Church. I did not know about the control situation, but I went to Don and I explained our dilemma and asked if it was possible that we could meet in the guild room. And he said, I'm not even gonna go to the women's guild. I'm going to give you permission to go ahead and do that now. And I was a little puzzled by that. What do you mean he didn't, wasn't gonna go to the women's guild? But um, the story of that is, ends that the, our Concord chapter of Compassionate Friends met in that room for many, many years and we are, I was, and still am, very grateful for having that space. Mm. Thank you, Linda. Yeah, Tim, go ahead. Uh, yes, I, I, I do ever remember the, uh, the famous crash crash, as it was <laughs> called immediately. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I think the reason it was that the Guild Room was hands down the room that I hoped we'd be able to use for Jazz Sanctuary is because it was always a room that I associated with a sense of a, a deep sense of community and connection. Mm -hmm. And so um, when we transformed the guild room each month, sometimes differently from one month to the next, no matter what configuration we chose to use, it was always a room of community. But one of my favorite memories was in one of the first ones, uh, Carol Blake uh, had been on our original sort of advisory committee about getting Jazz Sanctuary started. And he had the brilliant idea of taking cell phone pictures of exactly how the <laughs> furniture went when it went back after the Jazz Sanctuary <laughs> so that we wouldn't get in trouble. So I, I've always been so grateful to Carol for that. I didn't want to get in trouble. <laughs> Thank you both. I'll piggyback on to Go ahead, that. Carol. I don't think we did a very good job, however, despite the pictures, because it seemed like every time we'd still put it back in somewhat different ways, but that's okay. Nobody yelled at us. <laughs> um, my, I think my most um, prominent memory is uh, obviously of Jazz Sanctuary and of 
setting it up, tearing it down, mm. the sense of community. Mm. Uh, it was just a different kind of, and for me, a, a very um, uh, meaningful kind of um, service in a different way than the more traditional service. So I, for me, it sort of felt like it brought me into the church in a different kind of way. Mm. Um, but also that the prominent memory is the Mardi Gras service where we actually <laughs> had to, we <laughs> we had both rooms set up because we had so many people there um and i forget how it even worked but um it was Not quite, very well. <laughs> it was quite complicated and and as one of the jazz sanctuary deacons it was very chaotic but it was also very spirited and mm -hmm. and wonderful um yeah to celebrate so thank you carol mm -hmm. i'm gonna say pam and then everett I'm just going to say, as an interim minister, having gone through all of the training for certification, they talk about the DNA of the church and how it, it lasts even after the original, whatever the original situation was. Thank you. You just proved that out because I was probably 22-ish when they redid that um, guild room and and still that original direction and control um, lives in people who probably weren't there then. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Pam. Everett. Um, I just wanted to put Carolyn on the, on the um, right in the scene of this since she's one of the avid guild members. Um, Carolyn, have you got anything to say? <laughs> <laughs> or anyone else yet who also hasn't spoken feel free to unmute i would like to uh say Go that ahead. the guild room <clears throat> was my entry into the building um for the 12 step program every thursday noon and it was such a warm place of safety that that we never had a meeting that wasn't important or wasn't just a wonderful sharing and uh, it provided a really heal real healing process for all oh, between a dozen and two dozen members of, of the 12 step program. Thank you. Mm, thank you, Suzanne to the many groups who use that uh, this room the guild room for for just such meetings yeah ever go ahead one of the organizations i always was intrigued in watching and i used to come in every time they met was the um, weight watchers group mm -hmm. and it had to be set up just exactly right every tops. every uh, uh, tops at uh, tops that's what it, was. it had to be set up just right for it for every meeting you know but it, it always intrigued me watching um how interested and avid they were about their program and it was a good place for them to meet. Mm, absolutely. Thank you, Everett. Yeah, Edna. Um, the thing Edna. that I remember, I know that I must have said this before, but long before Adele started playing piano, Mason used to play the piano in that room after the service. Mm -hmm. And he'd have his um, collection cup for mo of money and he'd give that to um, the needy, the fund for the needy. And he, people always like that. Thank you, Edna. Thank you. Ellie Stokes? Well, you are currently muted, Ellie. Um, there you go. Oh, there I just I, I just wanted to say, I guess this goes on in all churches. I know in my church in Freedom, I can think of many of the same things going on there too. How we had funeral receptions there with people crying and happy receptions with the baptisms and then birthdays that we celebrated and tearing out one of the counters in the room and putting it on rollers so that we could put a elevator in to put our food pantry things in the basement and then push the uh, counter back up and nobody knew it was even there. I mean, so many things that happened in that one room 
And then it got so busy that we had to go do fundraising to build an addition onto it to make mm -hmm. another room adjacent to it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Ellie. Yeah, Eleanor? Another, Hello. Okay. Another oh. memory that I have is of um, our Mardi Gras pancake suppers. <laughs> Everett and Linda often cooked and, and th those were fun and a great opportunity for fellowship once again. Absolutely. Thank you, Eleanor. Carolyn, go ahead. Yes, I think I'm finally unmuted. You are. Um, <laughs> I had a nice speech and nobody could hear me. Um, oh, no. <laughs> it's only the last, uh, since I retired, that I really was active in the Guild. So most of my um, memories of the Guild are a lot more recent. Uh, I remember hearing stories about how... Uh, controlling the guild was about the room that you couldn't do this and you couldn't do that, which I strongly disagreed with at the time, which mm -hmm. caused uh, consternation among some of the uh, other members at that time. But I also remember the receptions that we've, we have had through the years and, and uh, how wonderful they were when people could get together. Unfortunately, many of the receptions were uh, after funerals, but uh, the memories that go in that room uh, and of people that maybe I hadn't known as well in the church as some of the others were wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, I found it very difficult the day after the church was sold when I walked into the guild room and the was just nothing there. Uh, and I think between that and the assembly room that day uh, seemed so forlorn when both of those rooms had been so active. Thank you, Carolyn. And that leads me into the place of reminding us all that we carry that warmth in us. And it's what we do to bring warmth into whatever space we are in to provide hospitality and community, that it is who we are that brings the warmth and lights up the spirit of a place and the energy of a space. And we will do that again. And I am thank you so much for all of the stories, knowing that there are more and invite you all to continue being in conversation um, about these sacred stories that we have, knowing that they continue with us in our hearts and they will um, provide hope for us as we create these new spaces for community and hospitality in the future. Thank you all so very, very much. At this time, I'm going to invite us to close this section of our worship together by singing Jesus Calls Us Over the Tumult, and we will sing three verses of this hymn. Adele, whenever you are ready. to share my screen once again to share our message from our conference minister.
my friends in our New Hampshire Conference, United Church of Christ Churches. For those who do not know me, I am the Reverend Gordon Rankin, whom you have called to serve among you as your conference minister. This past Wednesday, in the assault on our Capitol building, all of us saw something that we thought we would never see. I want to join with you today to add my prayers to yours, that the ways of love and peace may be restored in our country. I also wanted to offer a few pastoral words. I want to name what happened at our country's Capitol Wednesday as evil. It was not evil because of who the people who perpetrated this inherently are, nor because of their politics. It was evil because it was born of the lie that might and intimidation and violence are the ways to get what one wants. This is the same lie that has become codified in colonialism and white supremacy. It is a lie that perpetually divides and damages. And it is a lie that is antithetical to our Christian beliefs and teachings. One cannot love one's neighbor while using might, intimidation, and or violence in the context of that relationship. It is Jesus who says to us, you have heard it said an eye for an eye, but I say to you, turn the other cheek. Who names this as a lie and calls us to follow the ways of love? And here is the challenging part. In the face of this evil, I believe that there's work for us to do as church. I share with you two thoughts. None of us knows exactly what will happen over the days and weeks to come. This evil could even find its way into our neighborhoods. We know that it has in the past. We have all been bruised by what happened this week, but there are some among us who are more vulnerable. These are the ones in our society who are always more at risk. People of color, the LGBTQ community, our immigrant community, persons with mental and physical disabilities, those of other faiths. It has always been our call as church to love, support, and yes, even protect those among us who are more at risk. But church, I dare say in the light of the evil that has confronted us this week, that we need to be even more responsive to this call. Wednesday morning, newly elected Senator-elect Raphael Warnock was asked how his background as a pastor was, would inform his approach to uniting people in this divided time. He responded, Listen, if you have ever had to get folks who like anthems and folks who like contemporary gospel music to work together, then you can do anything. Amen. Church, there are many things that could divide us. We come from different backgrounds. We have different political beliefs. We understand God differently. Heck, all you Red Sox fans have even welcomed me as a Yankee fan among you. But we are able to work together. We're able to work together because we are committed to listening to how the divine speaks to us through one another's voices. It is true that we do this imperfectly, at times even with speed bumps, but we do it. We as church need to model this for the world around us. Too many have come to see differences only in terms of fears. It is incumbent upon us to help the world around us reject the evil that fosters these fears and show again that diversity only strengthens community. Friends, my prayers are with you, as they are with all of our nation. May the Holy Spirit bring grace and courage to us all in these days.
Amen. Amen. And with that, I invite you to join with me in our time of prayer together. This morning, I have for us a litany of prayers of intercession and affirmation originally from South Africa. And I invite you to join with me in the bolded print. It is not true that this world and its inhabitants are doomed to die and be lost. This is true. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him shall not die, but have everlasting life. It is not true that we must accept inhumanity and discrimination, hunger and poverty, death and destruction. This is true. I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. It is not true that violence and hatred shall have the last word and that war and destruction have come to stay forever. This is true. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given in whom authority will rest and whose name will be Prince of Peace. It is not true that we are simply victims of the powers of evil that seek to rule the world. This is true. To me is given all authority in heaven and on earth. And lo, I am with you always to the end of the earth. It is not true that we have to wait for those who are specially gifted, who are the prophets of the church before we can do anything. This is true. I will pour out my spirit on all people and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, your young people shall see visions, and your old folk shall dream dreams. It is not true that our dreams for the liberation of humankind, our dreams of justice, of human dignity, of peace, are not meant for the earth and this history. This is true. Behold, I am doing a new thing, now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. For our morning song this morning, I have taken from the Mexican tradition of the Day of the Dead. And I will be starting, we're doing the middle section of the song. If you want to see the whole song, let me know at a later time and I will share that link with you. Fueron mis 
Let us be in prayer together. O oh God, for the might of your wind on the waters, for the swelling of the open sea and the rushing of crested waves, thanks be to you. For the strength of life in our bodies, for the sap of life that flows and the yearnings for rebirth and abundance, thanks be to you. Restore in us the image of your life this day, that the longings of our hearts may be true and our passions for life be full. Release in us the freedom of your spirit, that our souls may be free and our spirits strong. And let us close our time of prayer together saying the Lord's Prayer as is printed in your bulletin. O oh, Berther, Father, Mother of the cosmos, focus your light within us, make it useful. Create your reign of unity now through our fiery hearts and willing hands. Help us love beyond our ideals and sprout acts of compassion for all creatures. Animate the earth within us. We then feel the wisdom underneath supporting all. Untangle the knots within so that we can mend our hearts simple ties to each other. Don't let surface things delude us, but free us from what holds us back from our true purpose. Out of you, the astonishing fire, returning light and sound to the cosmos. Amen. I invite you to join with me now in our closing hymn, As With Gladness Those of Old, Adele, When You Are Ready. silence as we close to set our intentions, whether it be for the week ahead or the day ahead or even just the hour ahead, depending on where your heart is in this moment.
And I invite you to join with me in our benediction and sending responsively and join with me on the bolded print. In the beginning, O oh God, your spirit swept over the chaotic deep like a wild wind and creation was born. In the turbulence of our lives and the unsettled waters of the world today, let there be new birthings of your spirit. In the currents of our own hearts and the upheavals of the world today, let there be birthings of your mighty spirit as we go forth reminded of our own baptism promises. Amen. And we close worship with our postlude, Adele, when you are ready. Thank you, Adele. Thank you, friends, for being present with us this morning. Whether you are going off into your day or you are staying for a virtual coffee hour, I invite you to do so in peace.